Hey everyone, welcome to Movie Films with Bill and Steve. I'm Steve. And I'm Bill. Movies talk. So let's talk movies. Let's talk those movies. How you doing, Bill? Uh, doing okay. It's been an okay week. Nothing much going on. Um, trying to think here if there's anything worth talking about that's in my personal life. I mean, not a ton. Just been hanging out, playing Metal Gear Solid 5. That's just been my life since it's come out. Just come home, either watch some wrestling with the wife, watch some movies with the wife for the show, or play Metal Gear Solid 5. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm still progressing so slowly in that game because most of my nights are, well, I have this side op. Let's go do this side op, and then let's spend some while, spend some time development, doing development, building up stuff, mother base, and maybe do a mission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like doing all the all the fucking around in that game. So other than that, doing doing okay though. I cannot complain. It's all easy going. Just uh, September is just a weird month where like everything that's super cool that I care about is happening later in the month. So it's just a lot of waiting, waiting around, doing that stuff. Understandable. Absolutely. How about yourself, Steve? Mostly the same. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, fuck. Just playing a bunch of Metal Gear Solid Five, which is a really good game. It's really light in the story, which is a bit of a letdown, uh, but the gameplay is by far the best in the whole fucking franchise. I don't know. I don't feel like it's light in story. I think it's all still there if you want it. If you find it, if you're listening to the tapes, if your missions have enough, there's always bits that come up. I will say, though, I hit R3 in the helicopter, and I feel like Kojima's trolling me or spoiling something for me or something, and I'm scared to do it again and find out what it was. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even mean to do it, and I'm like, oh no, what is this? I got spooked and upset. I mean, I don't really think it's a spoiler. I think it is literally just planting the seed for what the reveal is, you know? I, I mean, it's it's in the game itself. That's not a spoiler. Yeah, it's right As there. Well, it's right there if you like first launch the game and you find it. I hope it's not something super important. Yeah. I don't want to find out that Big Boss is a snatcher. <laughs> um, we'll find okay, out. so I'll let me see. restate. It's this. It's very light in cutscenes and story happening on screen, not including codec conversations or, in this game, cassettes. Because right because my biggest... Uh, I like Metal Gear Solid 2 a lot, but the biggest thing I hated about it was how many hours was just the codec instead of, like, actually being on screen. Fair enough. But then, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, but I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm so... At this point in the series, I'm so used to Kodak calls that didn't mind, bother me. So in this game, like, wow, I, I, it's so strange not having Kodak calls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just all these cassettes that I can listen to if I want to. I don't know. And, it's and just a bit... And they'll put emphasis on the ones that are kind of important. It's just a bit of a letdown, and I, I feel like a lot of them should have been cutscenes based on, like, the two people talking to each other that were cut for budget or time reasons. And I still miss David Hayter. Hey, the game's not over yet. That's true. Oh, man, I fucking... Oh, little, little tiny pre-teen solid snake showing up. Game's not over. Let's, find, let's wait and find out what's going on there. I want some ice cream. Although so far I really I really don't mind I actually don't even notice that, like I don't even missing that the fact that David Hayter's not Big Boss. I just don't think Kiefer is a as good of a voice actor as everyone else in the game. I don't Kiefer know, he is a talk, great he doesn't talk very much either. He's so like, which is which just makes it worse to me because uh, Kojima kept on talking about how he wanted uh, Kiefer instead of David, because he wanted someone that could physically act and voice act at the same time, because there was a lot of emotion coming out of Big Boss in this game, mm -hmm. and I've yet to see it. Hey, you know. That's all I'm saying. And I, I, might I think be, we're both, like, barely even halfway through the game, so... Oh, God, yeah. I know... The, the only reason why I know how many missions there are is because I know what number the last mission was supposed to be that was cut, and I won't tell you that so that, like, the number of missions gets spoiled for you. Gotcha. Um, but I'm at mission 20, and I'm not at the halfway point. Yep. <laughs> so, there's an idea for you for how big this game is. And that's it. Trying to schedule shooting stuff for the survivors. Uh, Hell Duke, yeah, shooting stuff. Duke got molded, finally. Whoa. Uh, so we just need to pour the molds, and then we're going to start working on the unicorn horn, which is completely going to be modeled after the unicorn from Legend, because... That's badass. We, we love that movie. That's badass. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So like a year, like a year later, what, we might have the short. For, it's for... it's fucking bullshit how long this has taken, and I'm really sorry to everyone that pre-ordered the fucking movie. We're still honoring all of the fucking pre-orders that we got, but this has taken far too long. It's there's no fucking excuse. Yeah, you know, you're you're when you're so dependent on weather, it's kind of a can be a bitch. That was, I mean, that was the biggest thing. But even that, I mean, there sh we should have did something better throughout the entire month where we were just sitting doing nothing, waiting for the weather. 
As long as you deliver in the end, people will always forgive. Well, this is actually this is definitely coming out. This is not going to be like a lot of other Kickstarter Indiegogo projects where nothing fucking happens. And also, I feel like I get this this timer on this one since all of my other projects that I've crowdfunded for have come out super on time. Yeah, so you take all the extra time and tack it on, so it's like you're like getting credits. Exactly. Towards your one delay. <laughs> towards the one delay. Boo yeah, baby. Boo yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. Well, so we got a little bit of news to talk about this week. Kind of light. I don't know what the deal is with everybody. It seems like everyone was just falling over themselves the past couple of weeks, and now we're just like, uh, yeah, stuff, I guess. Yeah. I guess there's some stuff going on. Uh, no, first thing, uh, kind of a super teeny, teeny tiny little thing to start off with. Um, Lucasfilm said that Star Wars Episode Eight it will begin shooting this month in Ireland. That's that. Awesome. <laughs> okay. They're going, they're going forward with the stuff. We are getting so many Star Wars movies so fast. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I'm excited. I'm yeah, keeping I'm everything a- in check, of course, because I, you know what, I'm not going to be. Hey, everything about Episode Eight seems really cool, but guess what? People thought everything for Phantom Menace looked really cool. Yep. Phantomus looks so good. You gotta keep everything in check anymore, but I feel like people forget that. They just think that, they just think because things are different now. They they know the mistakes from the prequels. Like, they knew the mistakes from, from Phantom Menace and they still made two more bad movies. Mm-hmm. It's like the only thing they heard was people didn't like Jar Jar, so they just, had, they just took out Jar Jar. It's like, no, that was the least of the problems. Absolutely that was the least of the problems. Jar Jar was a great character for the kids, and that's what he was meant to be. Yeah. Every every kid that saw episode one, like when they were a child, all liked Jar Jar. Well, not know. not I all. I didn't really like Jar Jar. I didn't like Jar Jar either, but a lot do. A lot do, and it's because that's who he was meant for, and that's fine. He just didn't do anything. Well, no, I agree. Literally, but... like in that whole movie, he doesn't do anything. I also hate fucking Gizmo from the Gremlins movie, so I'm not the best. Oh fucking... no, fuck you, Gizmo's rad. Gizmo's fuck Gizmo. Like, Gizmo and Gizmo, uh, Gremlins two, the new batch is all like I'm Rambo, motherfucker, and gets a fucking cool paperclip crossbow and sets it on fire and doesn't give a shit. Fuck yeah. you. Yeah, well, I just if we just kill Gizmo, all the problems go away. But Gizmo is adorable and well, drives, a little, drives a little Barbie car. Beep beep. Okay, here's what wins me over: Gremlins three. Uh, post-apocalyptic, gremlins have taken over the world, and the only ones left are a small band of humans being led by Gizmo, who has elected to become the monster version of itself to fight off the other gremlins. And Phoebe Kate uh, says, tells a heartwarming story about how her grandmother died on Arbor Day. Yes. My grandmother, then, my grandmother was just playing this tree, and and we didn't find, we couldn't find her and find her, and then we started smelling this, and we d- dug up the tree to find out the tree had fallen over on her inside of it, and and I just can't think of Arbor Day the same after that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I was going to keep going with my Gremlins 3 plot, but it's over now. <laughs> no, go ahead. My no, no, it's done. <laughs> well, you know what? Hey, until Joe Dante is set to direct it, I don't give a shit. You're right. Because uh, Joe Dante needs to direct every Gremlins movie. So yeah, what do you think that they're shooting for Episode Eight? Do you think it's just a scene or that they're super starting up actual production? No, I think they're starting, they're starting shooting because it, it, it's going to come out in two years, so they have to start shooting. No, you're right. Because the, the schedule right now is uh, seven this year, Rogue One next year, eight the year after that. Uh, I think that's the Boba Fett movie the year after that. I mean, it's every other year there's gonna be a Star Wars film. Well, every year. Oh, sorry. Every every every, every, every other, other year is a main f- main meant, franchise. Every other year is a, like a like a main flagship Star Wars film, and the off years are uh, side stories. Are they gonna stop at nine, or are they gonna do an episode ten? Uh, I'm gonna say they're. I don't know. If if the money keeps up and the quality of the films keep up, I think they'll keep going. Oh yeah. I don't see any other reason why I don't see any reason why not. Yeah. Except for maybe just to stick with the whole idea of just two trilogies. Yeah, and the whole idea of like Star Wars was supposed to be nine episodes, and then, well, not supposed to be. It was supposed to be one movie, then it became a trilogy, and then it became nine episodes, and then after the prequels came out, George Lucas said, "No, it was always just meant to be six. What about all these interviews where he said nine episodes? Uh, nope." You know, it's one of those strange things. I feel like back, even back like before Episode 1 came out, even as a kid, I feel like everyone has talked about the idea that there were supposed to be nine movies all the whole time. That's been in multiple interviews from George Lucas, and he literally just straight up lied and denied all of that information when he was finishing up the prequels. Because mm-hmm. he didn't want to make any more, which is fine. You know, Even as a filmmaker of something you love the most, eventually you get tired. This is also the man that 
fought against Turner colorizing movies and changing art of the past, but then went and did the special editions and have done more damage to his film since then. Yep. I love Lucas. Where's the special edition of Howard the Duck? That's all I want to know. <laughs> more, more like CGI. Uh, Completely replaced with the Guardians of the Galaxy CG Howard the Duck. No, no, it's like it's the same movie, but they just use all this. They just use this uh, all this um, industrial lights and magic technology to make the duck tits look better. <laughs> That's all they need to do. And more Leia Thompson. Those digitally put in more Leia Thompson. Perfect. Man, boom! Ten out of ten, perfect movie. All we need is more hot Leia Thompson. You know what else they should remake? Roadhouse. Yes, uh, you're in luck, boy. Really? This uh, yesterday, I think it was, it was pretty recent. Uh, they announced that Ronda Rousey will play the lead in the uh, remake of Roadhouse that MGM is planning. That's really cool. I wonder who they can get to star with it. I don't know. They, what about? They, have, they, have, they have Ronda Rousey, so I don't know. I think that's a good choice. Well, I just said that. I don't know why you're asking me to say it again. Well, I was leading into asking that, but you answered it before I could ask it, so I just asked it anyway. <laughs> Uh, be nice. When I have a plan, I stick to it, no matter, no matter how what, pointless no matter it is. What. The guy gives you attitude? Be nice. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the, Bill's pretty pumped about this. I'm I just kind of sitting here thinking, like, why, but Bill kind of sold me on it. Uh, I like Ronda Rousey a lot. I think, she, obviously, she's, a, she's fucking badass as shit, but I think she has a ton of charm. So I think the whole, I, I, I know I was trying to tell people who might be worried right off the bat that, because Patrick Swayze makes that movie a lot, because he's so charming. Yeah. But I think I think Ronda Rousey has it and and, uh, and and tons of it, tons of charm, tons of tons of charisma and everything from interviews and everything. She seems like a class act. So I think this and this will also be good because it'll be her first starring role. She's done a lot of just bit parts and you know for your seven and things like that. Um, my 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 dream goal for this film is that it's like the exact same script from Roadhouse, except there's a couple of gender flips. Uh, like I just want her to be like just put in that same same world. I right. want Sam Elliott to still be her cooler buddy that comes in to help. I want there to be like a evil, you know, martial arts lady who, when they're fighting at the end of the film, grabs Ronda Rousey and says, "I used to fuck girls like you in prison." It'd be perfect. I want Terry Funk to still be in the movie. <laughs> I want Keith David to be the bartender still. <laughs> like I want everything the same. I just want like the doctor part to be sw- gender, like to be flipped to be a man, and then I just want Ronda Rousey plugged in this universe. Let's fucking do it. It'd be amazing, but no, I. So I, yeah, it just depends on who they get to direct it, how they kind of handle it. I, I hope it sticks with this the same kind of um, schlocky cheese that Roadhouse is. So not not try to be super tongue in cheek, like haha, we're making a goofy movie, but stick, you know, keep true to the true to it. And I think it, I think it'd be fun. I think it would be. So yeah, just really, really the the factors can sit heavily on just who they have direct, but I don't know. I feel like Ronda might be able to carry it too. So. Mm-hmm. I'll, have to wait. I'll have to wait and see. Yeah, so, we'll far, see this. so far, I am very hopeful for this production. Normally, I'm not... Hey, then this is one of those cases of, yeah, here's the female roadhouse, and uh, everything about it so far I like. Uh, so you haters, people who think that all guys just hate female things, no. I just don't like Ghostbusters. Hey, it's almost like, you know, bad movie... We think bad-looking movies are bad. Uh, no, we are clearly... Uh, we just hate women. Uh, so yeah, we hate women. Okay, you're right. Fuck you, women. Yeah, women. Fucking stupid faces. You, you, you women and your boobs. Your boobs. I don't have those, so I hate you. Suckers. Ah. Ah. Butt face. Uh, so speaking of... It's butt faces. Butt faces. Everyone on the internet is taking something Zack Snyder said completely out of context. Completely out of fucking t- context. Imagine that. So basically, when we talked about before Steven Spielberg saying that the whole super superhero genre won't last or go the way the westerns. Well, Zack Snyder had a couple things to say about stuff, saying he isn't necessarily wrong. He thinks that uh, Batman Superman will stand the test of time, unlike say Flavor of the Week Ant Man. That's the but that's like the, the, that quote has been taken out of context so much. He's basically saying. I feel like he's right, but I feel Batman and Superman are transcendent of superhero movies in a way because they're Batman and Superman. They're not just like the Flavor of the Week Ant Man. Not to be mean, but whatever it is, what is the next? Uh, yeah, what is the next Blank Man? Uh-huh. <laughs> so he's basically saying like you know there are certain characters that no matter what will be trans like he's a transcendent like Batman and Superman, Wonder Woman is like American mythology, but there are there are plenty of characters like Ant Man. Say what you want about Ant Man, he's not that big of a deal compared to Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. 
and that there's that, like those particular DC characters are transcendent and hugely part of Americana, while there's plenty of other superhero films, not just Marvel, anything that don't necess- aren't necessarily that big of a deal and won't necessarily stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. And I I think that's a true statement. I don't think he's like he, he's not like every news site is taking his quotes and mumbling it around saying that he's you know firing shots at Marvel. Like his films are so much better. And of course everyone's doing the whole well Zack Snyder's full of shit. Blah 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 blah. It's like well if you you know, read the article and read the quote, the quote in context, you know, you might understand what the fuck's going on here. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, I think he was speaking the truth. Batman and Superman are ingrained in the DNA of our society. They are, they are modern mythology. Like, everyone knows who the fuck they are. They've been around for decades. They'll be around for decades, and their popularity has always been peak. Yeah, I mean, there's been movie media like entertainment of Batman Superman all the way back to the 40s of serials mm-hmm. so I think that means they're pretty much bulletproof in that regard so um, I don't and I yeah like you were saying that. you know like fucking a lot of the other superhero movies aren't gonna be that iconic yeah you know what Ant-Man was fun but it just kinda came out and then Ant-Man's gonna be in the team up movies and that's it yep no one no one cares in yep. mainstream mm-hmm. like it's it's not a huge fucking thing. I mean, Ant Man is not someone that you can mention anywhere, and everyone knows who you're talking about. You mentioned Batman, you mentioned Superman, you mentioned Wonder Woman. Everyone knows who the fuck you're talking about. Hell, even the Flash, and to a degree, Green Lantern. You know, those characters are all Aquaman. Even if his popularity is more infamous than legitimate, because of people making jokes about him, uh, the DC characters are very, very much uh, ingrained in what modern. Um, uh, fucking, what's the kind of word I'm looking for? I lost it, but they're very Is ingrained the in our society. Zeitgeist? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that kind of word you're Yeah. For. Um, like, they are, they're bigger than life type characters, especially Batman Superman. And all he was saying was that. He said, you know, working on this sort of movie is that these characters will last forever, regardless of what he does. Mm-hmm. Versus other characters that will be forgotten. Yeah, I think it's completely fair. And it's not... Like he's sitting there trying to say, uh, Marvel's a bunch of duty heads. Yeah, he's not at all saying that. But every, but trust me, I mean, I, I hope the few people that listen to our podcast will hear this, not just read some article that, because I looked at it, every article that was getting kind of linked to on IMDb was just like taking this quote and completely taking it apart to make it seem like he's shitting on Marvel movies. And it's like, no, <laughs> you fucking piece of shit, clickbait, bull, gar- bull garble, garble crap. Yeah, they're just they're and also my favorite part was that they were taking two completely separate conversations and putting them together as if they were one sentence where he was shitting on Marvel. Yeah, exactly. Like they were completely two different trains of thought, completely un, completely separate, have nothing to do with each other, and all these fucking clickbait articles just want to fucking oh fucking Zack Snyder shitting on Marvel, just get these clicks. Yeah, that's exactly what those are. I I want to give a shout out to one of the sites we got our news stuff from Slash Film and Angie Han who uh, wrote this article. Her headline was Zack Snyder responds to Steven Spielberg's superhero comments. "Quote: I feel like he's right. That's that's what her article is titled. She didn't do the whole bullshit like everyone else did. Where it's like, good. I, I want to give a huge shout out. You know, and obviously this probably won't ever reach her, but I think she did, it was great. She's better than every other fucking website, just doing the whole trying to fuel flames to get clicks. Because any people won't even read the articles. They'll read the headline, think, oh, well, he's sitting on movies. Well, fuck him. It's like, no, go fuck yourself. Why don't you actually read something for once and understand what the hell is going on?" So that's that's about that. Now, uh, we were a little light on news this week, but we did have a couple of stuff you wanted to t- chat about before we get into our main discussion this week. Uh, Steve, how, how is that Mad Max? Um, I just want to remind everyone that Mad Max Free Road is fucking unbelievable. I rewatched it at home, which is the fifth time I've seen this film now, and it still blew me away with how good it was. It is so good. It is beyond good. I can't describe how good the movie is, how perfect the movie is. If I could be a quarter as talented as George Miller is... I would be so fucking good as a filmmaker. Well, like, clearly you should have been a doctor and then made it became a filmmaker. You're right. I'm going to go to doctor school. Go to doctor school. Be a doctor. What kind of a doctor should I be? A uh, butt doctor. Okay, let's do it. Butt doctor, and then I will make my own amazing film after being a doctor. Because I'll know what it's like to be a doctor, I guess. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, That's it's, a secret. it's so fucking good. It's unbelievable. Please go see it. Buy it physically. Because you should own it on your shelf to display so everyone else can see it. Don't fucking download it like an asshole. And I really hope George Miller directs Man of Steel 2. Or any DC movie at all. 
Yeah, I hope so. I, I, I have always liked George Miller. And it's funny, like, when you think about Mad Max, Road Warrior, Babe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Babe 2, Babe, Pig in the City, Happy Feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Happy Feet were good, honestly. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mind Happy Feet, but whatever. I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's funny how just how... He's different. diverse. Yeah, his, uh, his, his filmography is, but... So, yeah, yeah, I, I still need to check that out again. I only, I sad I still only got the one theater C, but I hopefully will be checking out IMAX when it pops back up this week. Hell yeah. Um, for me, uh, about two weeks ago, I saw a trailer for a movie called Turbo Kid, which was coming out this year, a kind of indie, a small indie film. I wouldn't say small, I don't know, an indie film, uh, you know. And uh, I watched the trailer, I'm like, well, this seems right my alley. It could either be good or bad. So I was just sitting around, and I looked on Amazon. It was on Prime, so if you have Amazon Prime, you can check it out for free. Uh, I'll just read IMDb's thing on it. In a post-apocalyptic wasteland, a comic book fan dons the persona of his favorite hero to save his enthusiastic friend and fight a tyrannical overlord. I guess that's what's happening that happens in this movie. <laughs> uh, the, movie is, the movie is set in the post-apocalyptic world of 1997, and uh, similar to Mad Max, there's no water. So water's a value resource. And Michael Ironside plays a dude who basically controls a, gang, a big gang and he creates water, so he has a stronghold over people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the general gist. And there's a kid whose favorite like, comic book guy is a turbo turbo rider, and he ends up stumbling across the, apparently the turbo rider in this universe is a real person. He finds his costume and then he becomes turbo kid. He is, oh, like, look at me, I have a super powerful gauntlet. He has a robot friend who's a, who's adorable. Um, the movie's hyper violent. Awesome. Yeah, I just really appreciate the film. Like I feel like a lot of movies try to do like we talked about Kung Fury. It's trying really hard to be like this '80s thing. Ah, wow. This movie does a way better job of that because it understands. Yes, you can still do the '80s thing and have some like weird, kitschy like things, but still try not make your movie. I don't know. Try to go off the deep end with it. Mm-hmm. Like there's still a lot of things like everyone in this movie rides bicycles, which is which great. Makes, which is great because it's supposed to pop up to wasteland where we're always. Why would everyone be driving cars? Not to poke you know shit at the Mad Max films, but that's a good take on this. Where it's like everyone's just riding BMX bikes. It makes sense. <laughs> it's rad and it makes sense in universe and everything. And this is full stuff. And Michael Ironside is incredible. That's awesome. He's Michael Ironside. He's always incredible. Yeah, because he's Michael Ironside. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I've heard yeah. I've heard mixed things about Turbo Kid. I've heard uh, both like both opposing opinions from people that I trust when it comes to movie opinions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I need to see it for myself to see what I think of it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think you might like it, but I could be wrong. Well, the guy who I usually really trust for movie opinions uh, hated Man of Steel and mm-hmm. hated Turbo Kid. Uh, you liked Man of Steel and liked this movie, so I think I'll like this movie. That's yeah, what I'm basing not, it on. That guy, that guy seems like he doesn't like a lot of things. He does. He does like a lot of other things that most people don't like, but then I also like. That's funny. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things. Movies are so subjective, and that's what I think is cool about it, you know? Absolutely. I agree. But yeah, check out Turbo Kid if you can. I, know, I think they're doing Indiegogo to get, uh, like, early copies of home, vi- like, Blu-rays and stuff. You can check that out. And, or I, but I think they might be getting a distribution deal soon. But either way, you can check it out on, on, on demand on uh, Amazon iTunes, all stuff. Check it out. I liked it a lot. It really is charming, and I, I'll probably watch it again here soon. I just watched it recently. Normally, I don't do that for a lot of movies, so. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Check that out. Check it out. Uh, moving on to our main topic of this week. We're back to musicals. Musicals! Oddly enough, both are kind of similar in some regard. A little bit. A little bit. Uh, so, yeah, before we talked about Rocky Horror and Shock Treatment, well, we're back, baby! Kicking it off with uh, 1974's Family of the Paradise from Brian De Palma. Mm-hmm. A disfigured composer sells his soul for the woman he loves so that she will perform his music. However, an evil record tycoon betrays him and steals his music to open his rock palace, the Paradise. This uh, summary of the film is horrific and terrible. Yep. IMDb is always great. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't really sell his soul. I mean, he, he accidentally, but it's not like that's the plot. Okay, so Family of the Paradise is essentially the story of the Family of the Opera. And don't get confused, people. This is all before Andrew, Le- Andrew Lloyd Webber's bullshit. Just more like the, the film. Yeah. And, so, and such, like, you know, the story. Um, it's about Winslow Leach, who is a composer, writes his uh, huge cantata about Faust, the legendary German hero, uh, mythic, mythic uh, story, story about a man who sells a soul for fame and glory. 
uh, his music is stolen by Swan, played by Paul Swan. Williams, who in this world is like a u- uber music tycoon, and he steals it so he can open up his uh, rock pa- uh, Xanadu, the the paradise. Uh, Winslow's not too happy about this. When he tries to confront it, he goes to jail. Basically, it's fi- disfigured, uh, thought to be killed, and basically it goes from there. Like you know, you expect your family of the opera type story to go. Obviously, with the uh, some good 1970s twists on the music and other um, aspects, and uh, of course the the story of Faust also factors into this film because the film is also works the, that in with the story of the family of the opera. Yeah, and a little bit of Dorian Gray in there too. Yes, there's that. There, yeah, you're right. I I knew there's one other thing, but I never could remember what it was, and that that is hit it on the point. Now, Steve, this is I believe your first time seeing *Family of the Paradise*. Was I am I correct? Yes. This is the so first what time did ever. you think about *Family of the Paradise*? I thought it was okay. Uh, it was it was a lot of stuff that was good. There was some stuff that I didn't dig. Uh, all in all, it was okay. Uh, I'm glad that I watched it. Like it's, I definitely uh, respect what it is, and I really like um, Brian De Palma as a director, so I saw a lot of his style in it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I enjoyed it, but I, I felt it was okay. I'm on the opposite of the spectrum. I absolutely love this film. It is uh, second to Blowout for my favorite Brian De Palma film. That's probably one of my favorite, well, close to being up there for my favorite musicals. Uh, I probably owe a lot to that to Paul Williams, because Paul Williams is amazing. Mm-hmm. If you love anything Muppets related, you owe it to Paul Williams, probably, because he wrote, you know, um, any, uh, what Fuck, I might be blanking. Kermit's song. Um, Ain't, Ain't, Ain't Easy Being Green? Yeah. No, no, no. Rainbow Connection. Rainbow Connection, yeah, yeah. yeah Paul Williams go. wrote that. Paul Williams wrote the uh, Muppets Christmas Carol. I mean, Paul Williams has done so much for the Muppets music-wise. Yeah. So, I mean, most people know his work. Paul Williams uh, plus, is a fantastic uh, musician. He is. Uh, it, it's sad that most he just doesn't... He, like, when Shaw Factory did their Blu-ray for this film, he can't really do... Pre- uh, contribute much because he spent most of the 70s drunk <laughs> he talks about all the time how he went on like the tonight show like i think he said like 70 times only remembers like two of them <laughs> that's fantastic it's because he's he is a t- t- horrific alcoholic during this period he's very he's sober now and has been sober for a long time he, he's very you know proud to talk about he's very know, honest his, about yeah, yeah about his problems in the past but he's super sober now but uh it, i have to say like i don't know he still delivered great music for this film and great great performance um I'm trying to think where to go from here because i i guess let's just i mean let's see what steve uh, i guess thought about the film what did you like about the film steve um off the top of my head what i liked about the film one of the things that i really liked was the whole design of the phantom mm-hmm. i thought he looked cool as shit uh, the silver teeth worked. The mask was awesome. The uh, one visible eye was great. The whole suit was great. I really, really liked the Phantom in the film. The weird robot voice, had, just to make him even more different, was fun and had a decent explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved Beef so much. Beef is awesome. I could not get enough of Beef. I wanted Beef to be in the whole film the whole time. <laughs> Because Beef was fantastic. He was a fun character that was great on screen, uh, was a good singer, and I kind of felt bad for him because he was just fucking entertainer doing the gig. But he well, did he, he did get fairly warned. He did. He I mean, uh, Phantom did not straight up murder him. He gave him a warning first, and I respect that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of little, like, subtle things in the film. A lot more than I would have expected. Uh, I mean, it's Brian De Palma. So, I mean, I'm not questioning him as a filmmaker. Just a lot of tiny jokes, like uh, when the Juicy Fruits are now the the fucking new band. Which, uh, the Undead for Beef? No, no. Are you you talking about when they're like the... uh, The surf ones. The surf band? Well, that's still like technically the Juicy Fruits. No, they are. What what I'm saying is that it's the Juicy Fruits, but now they're being rebranded, and they're just wearing like terrible, shitty wigs over top of their real hair that's not covered up correctly. Yeah. I just love how the Juicy Fruits just keep putting put into stuff. They're like the greasers part at the beginning. They're the surf, the stupid like beach, blink, uh, beach blanket bingo type, you know, surf beach crap. Yes. Then they're like this the band for beef. Like they just keep like moving around. Yes. And, sing, and doing all these different parts. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Like they're just actors at this point. Yes. But I like that a lot. Like I really liked that. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, uh, Harper was fantastic. 
Yes, uh, Jessica Harper, as we talked about. This her was her before. debut, right? Yes, uh, she had done a couple things, like she done hair on in the musical before. But I think everyone in this period that did stuff did hair. I mean, that's not <laughs> surprising. Right. Uh, but yeah, she had done that. But this is like her uh, debut film. Uh, but yeah, that's the that's the biggest stuff that I really liked. And like I said, overall, like it was well made and shot and edited and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, off the top of my head, those are the peak stuff that I really, really, really dug. Gotcha. Um, I agree with you. I love the design of uh, of um, the Phantom. It's fantastic. Of beef. Love the juicy fruits of uh, Jess Carper. I like Paul Williams as Swan. Plays a smarmy asshole so fucking well. <laughs> I love the whole contract signing with Winslow. That was so. Fun. That was great. Uh, the only thing that throws me off with uh, Schwam is that uh, when his high school fling shows up, mm-hmm. they make it a big deal that she looks like his mother and that she looks really old, but she's the exact same age as Paul Williams. And I just felt that was a little. Well, Paul Williams, yeah, because Paul Williams <laughs> is like looks so young. He's like looked that way since he was like eight years old. Yeah, <laughs> and he talks about that. Like he never stopped. He stopped growing. He has he's always had good looks. Yeah, it just, it just threw me off. Like it wasn't right. it wasn't a negative. It just made me go. I mean, uh, I fully believe that they dated in high school. Oh wow, he looks exactly the same. Well, yeah, it's not it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I see. It's because he's evil. Okay, I get it. But yes. <laughs> I leave love that bit. It's like I'm gonna kill myself because I'm aging. <laughs> like that sounds like such a sensibilities of a shitty pop star. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the devil, devil comes to cut up a deal. And I love that whole bit. Um, where to go uh, here? Uh, I guess man, that's I, I, guess I like the film most as most as a whole. I like the whole um, everything at the paradise. I love the whole end sequence when everyone's just like losing their going ape shit. Going ape shit. Meanwhile, yeah. there's like horrific things going on around them, but the, like, everyone in the audience is like on such a like entertainment high that they can't even be bothered to pay attention or care. They're just yeah. too caught up in it all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um. Uh, some weird, uh, fun things, in case you didn't know. Uh, originally, it wasn't supposed to be Death Records. It was supposed to be Swan Song. And uh, but that was changed because uh, is apparently a song that Led Zeppelin did, okay. and they would not play play ball, so they were told they can't use any of that stuff. So you'll see sometimes in the film that explains you'll... why that logo is superimposed. Yes, <laughs> so that is probably one like... of the bad. Yes, it, it, it is bad, and they know it, but they had to make that imposed logo when uh, when um, Schwan is uh, giving the uh, introduction to Beef at the airport. Uh, and there's a, there's a, yeah, I think that's the most egregious piece of. Uh, um, imposing, uh, but other it'd be also other other spots in the film you can see like when uh, Winslow's breaking into the the record factory, you can see the lo- the original Swan Song logo above and stuff. A couple layers on that. So if you see that stuff and you're confused, that's 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 why it was just a thing they had to change, but they couldn't necessarily catch everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the music. I love how it's all different. Like they have this nice fifties uh, nostalgia, as they called it in the film songs, and you have other stuff that's more around the period you have rock all types of stuff um i really appreciate how uh it's a small thing that people might miss but like uh winslow's faust like when he sings it that's like the same i don't know uh, beats and general theme of the song is like the exact same as when the juicy fruits are singing it oh yeah yeah it's you know it's easy to miss but it's 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 funny how it's just like Okay, we have the song. Uh, change the lyrics to be about uh, this guy's upholstery in his car when he's hanging out with some hot chicks. <laughs> Let's just do that. Uh, and I guess, did you um, have any favorite songs in the film? Like, did like we usually do our top threes? Were there any that you wanted? To See, honestly, on? that's one of the reasons why the movie wasn't a big hit with me. I don't like the music in this movie at all. Really? To me, the best I mean, that's song. Subjective. That's that's totally fair. Yeah, and it's completely subjective. And I'm not saying they were bad. Mm-hmm. They were all well sung and great, um, but the only, the one the best song to me by far was the hell of it, <laughs> like uh, which is the end of the fucking movie, uh, and uh, life at last by Beef. Yeah, that entire, I want to say like my favorite thing about the entire film is the um, somebody super like you and life at last like that whole like sequence mm-hmm. is great. <laughs> uh, I love it. Somebody super like you was a fun song. It just I I liked. It the scene more than I like the song. That's fair. Which is a, a lot of how I feel about Rocky Horror at times. That's, that's <laughs> absolutely very fair. I guess for me, if people are caring about what I think is the best stuff, um, probably uh, Goodbye, Eddie, Goodbye by the Juicy Fruits that opened the film. I like that quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I like so, so, Somebody Super Like You and Life at Last, but I kind of put those as like one thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree, yeah. And then uh, probably the Phantom theme that's kind of like... Being played, beauty. It's also Beauty and the Beast. It's one that's being played over 
when Winslow is writing all the music for Schwann. Mm-hmm. I like that one quite a bit. Those are probably my top three. If I, was in. I don't know. Any, any, any given order, I think they're all really good. But yeah, I think The Hell of It is a great en- ending song to the film. Oh, it's yeah, absolutely. It's a good song on its own, and as a as an ending song, it's perfect. Because yeah, the movie super ends on a downbeat, as it should, and then he's got this you know heavy just you know like bass drum beat to it as the as it you know, exits the film yeah great song can i yeah. will not not say enough good things about that song I, okay now i want to get your the fair side of it like what didn't you like about the film uh, one of the biggest things that turned me off was before he becomes before uh will um i almost called him wilson winslow. Be- before winslow becomes the phantom the film is a fucking trod through the mud to me it was so slow and uninteresting and unentertaining i didn't care about it at all until it becomes the phantom it was a chore for me to watch Hmm. and i don't know why that is i can't even give any advice or like direct criticism but i was just sitting there going like fucking come on can we fucking fucking do something that's not even that long of a segment i know it's it becomes the phantom pretty quickly i I legitimately thought, and I'm not saying this to be a dick, I'm not saying this to, like, be fucking hip, trendy, fucking, to be an asshole, I legitimately I thought he d- he became the Phantom at the 45-minute mark. <laughs> <laughs> I moved my mouse over the screen, and I was just like, Jesus fucking Christ! Halfway through the film, the Phantom shows up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was a huge fucking turnoff. And other than that, the biggest thing was just the music. And to me, to me, that's the biggest thing with a musical, is do I like the music? Do I like the characters? And, you know, I like the Phantom. I like Swan. Uh, but as much as I like Jessica Harper, and as good as she did, I didn't give a shit about her character at all. She was. Mm-hmm. I felt that she was barely in it. I, I didn't get much for why Winslow loved her so much, aside from her voice. Uh... I mean, the most interesting character of the film was Beef, who seemed like he was just supposed to be kind of a joke character, but to me, he was by far the most three-dimensional. Uh, and and that's not a bad thing, you know, because Beef is fucking awesome. Everyone that sees this movie will agree with us. But I don't know, it, it, just, it just felt like it, it came up a little short. Fair enough. Just a little bit in every aspect, uh, but especially Act 1. Act 1 just turned me off so much from the film, and after that, it picked up a lot better, and the pacing was fine. Like, no complaints about the movie pacing or editing or timing-wise after that. But up until then, it was, that it was to me, pretty bad. Okay, fair enough. Doesn't seem too bad off. I mean, I don't have a lot of problems with it. I love, like I guess I love the music. It really clicks with me really well. Um, the way the movie shot. I love to uh, enjoy it. So I mean, it's one of those things where it just, uh, you know, yeah. I just wanted to see your side of it, because I don't want to see your gush about mm-hmm. it when you clearly did not like the film because i know it will be different here in a couple minutes absolutely <laughs> uh i don't know what else to say about the fan fam- that hasn't been said before i mean is there um, anything that you don't like about the film uh because i know you love it and that's fine I do. but is there now, anything now, if i um because even i have a couple things i don't like about the movie we're about to talk about and i, I love kind that of, one. i kind of agree with you that i feel like at times it feels like uh um phoenix's character is a little hollow mm-hmm but that doesn't necessarily bother, bother me too much. It's one, of those, like, it's one of those moments where everything else in the film is covering up for some of its flaws. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't bother me too much. And that's fine. And a lot of times, and especially musicals, there will be characters that are kind of just kind of MacGuffins. Like, they're mm-hmm. plot points as opposed to characters. That happens a lot in musicals. Yeah. And and that's fine. That's sometimes part of the genre. But, you know, I, I still don't like it. <laughs> yeah, this would be one of those cases probably where I would just probably point that whatever slight flaw, flaws I might find in the film when I'm watching it are covered up by all the positives. And that's totally cool, too. Yeah, I mean, there are tons of films that do that, mm-hmm. but where it's like, I might, any other time, say, like, let's say, Transformers Age of Extinction. Yeah, people hate that movie, but for me, it works. Mm-hmm. Between uh, uh, Kelsey Grammer, between um, uh, Marky Mark, between everybody, like, everyone else, everyone in that film just makes up for all the problems. Yeah. The, you know, where to where I'm not, I don't even know what the problems are. I'm just watching, like, yeah, this is great. I love it. I don't even know what the problem is here. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's one of those things where I can't even find things. It's similar to The Phantom. I, I'm sure when I'm watching it, I might go, eh, this, that, and that, but I, I can't recall it very well. I'm just like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a great movie. I love it. <laughs> I like everything about it. I like Phil Ben. I like how, I like the beginning of the film where he talks about how he's upset that they paid off the judge and the judge still ruled against them and everything. And yeah. <laughs> 
all this stuff. And it all works. And it's funny to me uh, when we talked about shock treatment, how Jessica Harper is still this character who means well, but then gets caught up in fame and then like yeah. goes back on everything she talks about. It's, like, this, it's funny, yeah. <laughs> just the same character. Yeah, I'm just going to sure. pretend that she's not Phoenix, she's Janet. She's Janet. <laughs> Where's Brad? <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't met Brad yet. That's, no, that's right. She, she meets him after this. Exactly. She, the, she, she's, the she becomes attracted to meek, um, smaller men because of Winslow's kindness. That's true. <laughs> Poor Winslow. That's one of the things I was first watching this film when he stabs himself when he sees Schwan with uh, Phoenix. I thought, man, this film's ending really soon. <laughs> <laughs> and then it comes up like, oh, oh, I like the. He's the devil. This. I, I like the direction they're taking this, where like he can't die because he's tied to Swan, and Swan can't die because he has a contract with the devil. And that Swan also has some devil powers, I guess, which was kind of weird, but fine. What what devil powers are you talking about? Uh, making Winslow immortal. Well, that's the contract. He signed the contract. I think they're also implying that when he watches that, it wasn't Swan making Winslow sign the contract. It was the devil ma- taking the appearance of Swan, making him sign the contract. Because when Swan's watching the tape back. Swan's voice on the tape says the devil voice that's on when he's watching the tape of when he originally signs the contract. Mm, you know what? I didn't notice that. You're probably right. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't notice that. That's cool. I, I've seen this movie several times. I just t- kind of picked up on it this time. I was like, oh, oh okay. Like, it, it, <laughs> like find, find that gear clicked over. I'm like, because I never really bothered me before. I'm like, okay. Oh, yeah, not a negative. Contract. Yeah. Um, but I finally picked up. I'm like, okay, that's a clever touch. Yeah, that is cool. Uh, uh other notable thing, I guess, is uh, De Palma's uh, usual thing of having a split camera, so having one thing fall another thing when the Phantom put, plants a bomb on a car that's supposed to sabotage the Juicy Fruit yeah. sack. Yeah, forgot to name that as one of my favorite things. That's a great... It's well shot. It's really so well good. Shot. Yeah. But it's De Palma, so... Yeah, De Palma he, does that. <laughs> he, this is back when De Palma is still a pretty damn good director. Yeah. This is, this, you know... Things, things come later, though, that, that have trouble with that. But, anyways, um, I'm sure our star ratings are very differently... For me, it's a five out of five because I love the film a lot. I give Works it great for me. I give it a three out of five. Totally fair. Yeah, uh, is it like uh, like I said, you know, I I like it, but I just think it's an okay movie. Uh, well, uh, you're wrong. I love the film. You're wrong. The film's perfect, brilliant. Uh, your opinion sucks. Eat my dick. Okay. If this was any other uh, place on the internet, that's what you'd hear. But this is a cordial, friendly podcast, so we can agree to disagree or agree to say, like, hey, I like this film, you didn't. That's cool. Let's shake hands. Why didn't you like it? Why did you like it? Neat. Neato. Now things are going to go on the flip. We're, we're, we're going to talk- flip around, yeah, in a big way. We're going to do a flipty flip, flip, flip. We're talking about Stage Fright. Stage Fright, two- the 2014, 2014 film. Uh, this is one of Steve's top favorite films last year. It was. Uh, a snobby musical theater camp is terrorized by a bloodthirsty killer who hates musical theater. Well, to be fair, that that's pretty spot on. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Steve, you want to like lead this one off a bit because this is like you're the film that you really introduced me to. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Stage Fry was a film that I just randomly saw on Netflix once. Uh, I knew that it had come out, but it had a very limited theatrical release because it didn't do well in theaters, which I kind of get, as much as I do love the film. It is a very uh, kind of a niche audience, I feel, that would enjoy the film. Uh, yes. So I finally saw it, uh, and I fell in love with it, bought it on Blu-ray, you know, I watch it, and it's still fantastic. Uh, the plot, it opens in quote-unquote the past, where they're doing the Phantom, the Haunting of the Opera. Haunting of the Opera. Which, to me, was a hilarious satire on stage. Uh, and it's the classic, oh, the fucking, this, someone's parents dead, let me fast forward to modern day, with a bunch of ridiculous musical theater characters. And they are characters that I can 100% recognize from people that I actually know in musical theater. That's how a lot of these people are, which made it that much better for me. Uh, Meatloaf is in it. He plays the camp counselor. Uh, there is no Ernest at this camp, so knock a half a star off for that. And, and uh, yeah, as the synopsis says, they're trying to put on a <laughs> kabuki version of the haunting of the opera. Which my favorite part of that gag is that nothing about it... Uh, the show has been changed except the costumes and one Japanese gong, which is hyper-racist and hilarious. Otherwise, everything is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of in-jokes about other musicals. There's a lot of in-jokes about musical theater in general. And lots of tunes. And The Killer, I personally liked a lot, but he was heavily underutilized. Yep. Uh, heavily underutilized. And I'll get into a couple of the negatives with the film later. But yeah, I think it's a fun flick, so let's get into it. Uh... What did you like about the movie, Bill? 
Okay, what did I like? I got a short list of likes. And that's fine. I know I, liked, I know that Bill I, does not like this movie. <laughs> I liked Ellie McDonald as Camilla, Camilla Swanson. I thought she was very pretty. I liked her singing. I thought she was very fun. And I, I liked her a lot as the lead. And I liked Meatloaf, because it's Meatloaf. And I like the fact that Meatloaf is like the pseudo-villain. Not necessarily like the main villain, but a villain. I really appreciated that. Yeah. He was really good in this. He, I mean, I don't think Meatloaf ever really, you know, phones it in when he's doing acting. Oh, no, so. he never does. So I liked him. I liked Adam McDonald. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. I think I, that's on, that's probably about it. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I liked a lot about the movie. I mean, like I said, I like a lot about it. I like the a lot of the makeup decisions that they did for the uh, Kabuki version, which made a lot of cool visuals. I like a lot of the songs. Yeah. I like a yeah. lot of the characters. Um. I like the visuals. I will say it's a well-made film. When I say I don't like it, I'm not trying to say that the people who made this film made a shitty-looking film. It's a well-made film. Uh, I mean, it's just the problems that rely on scripts. Yeah. Um, I like... One of the things that I really dug was how different a lot of the music was, depending on who was singing it. And I liked a lot of the jokes. I, I liked a lot about the movie. I think, for me, it'll be easier for me to talk about what I didn't like, because that list is shorter for me. And then we mm -hmm. can start discussing like what you didn't like about the film, and, and why I liked stuff that you didn't like. That's fair. Um, so, to me, the biggest knocks that the film has is... Oh, yeah, and I love the slasher's weapons. I thought like that was that, pretty the, fucking uh, clever. Can, the yeah, can lids. yeah, because for the longest part of the film, I mean, unless you notice, uh, they just look like fucking buzz saws, and then you're like, oh, those are fucking can lids. I get it. I get it. Yeah. But I dug that. Um, the biggest problem that I have with the film is that this movie was clearly written and directed by a fan of musical theater and not a fan of slasher films. Yeah. Uh, I can totally see that. Yeah, and and the parts that are fucking musical theater related are the top notch, like five out of five, perfect. But the parts that are supposed to be like the slasher horror film part definitely come up short. And again, I say that as a big fan of this movie, but if you're watching this movie for a slasher film, you're going to be heavily disappointed because the kills are uninspired, the gore is nearly non-existent, yeah, and the slasher himself is again. Fantastic to me, hilarious, great, love the voice, love the fact that his music is fucking hair metal. Very much underused. Very yeah. much underused. And the mask is cool and everything's cool, but he's barely fucking in it. If he was in this movie for, like, ten additional minutes, I think the movie would greatly benefit from it. I think he could have been uh, another one of those new slashers that mattered more than a lot of the other new slashers. Like, he could... I wouldn't say necessarily Leslie Vernon status... But he would matter more than a lot of the other fucking random slashers we've been getting in the past, like, ten fucking years. If yeah. if he was in the movie more. But he's not. Possibly. Sure. Uh, so that's, that's my biggest knocks in the film. Okay. Uh, uh... And I, I thought that the ending was dumb, but I get that they were going for a kind of an homage to slasher movies, except they didn't want it to actually be a killer was actually behind the fucking mirror, because that's impossible. But I still thought it was dumb. Yeah, it's a little kind of dumb. <laughs> this, end, this end your fucking movie. Don't try to be smart. Yeah. It could have ended on that down. you look like an idiot. Yeah. Okay, so what did you not like about the film, Bill? Okay, try to emphasize on your, some of your points. Uh, I felt like the film didn't know what it wanted to be. I felt like there wasn't enough musical stuff to make it a musical, and I didn't think there was enough horror stuff to make it a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Like, when the people gets to camp the first time, there's a bunch of, like, group singing. I'm like, oh, this is like a musical. Then there's, like, nothing until Meatloaf does a song, kind of. Everything else is just them practicing the musical. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I thought there was going to be more. The music, music part, and then when it came to horror, yeah, the mom gets killed at the beginning, and then like nothing happens until the until the director dies. Well, I will say uh, about the music thing with a lot of the songs being just them practicing the show. That's and this is going to actually hark back to what I said about Phoenix about it just being kind of a trope of musicals. Uh, that's a pretty common thing with uh, shows within a show where a lot of the music and a lot of the singing is just actually from the show within the show as opposed to the actual characters. And that doesn't mean that that excuses that and that you should not knock it. Again, <laughs> it's a trope, but you can still dislike it. I just felt the need to explain that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's fine if it's it's fine if it works for you. It did not work for me. Just because it made the film, the, film, the film feel uneven. It didn't feel like... It felt very, like... I don't know, there's a big pile here of horror, pile here of musical, and then it's just kind of like sifting into the middle, but not really getting enough of either, mm -hmm. for me. 
Uh, when it came to the, the killer, it's like, they keep showing him these weird rooms. He's just saying stuff. I don't... Where is he? What is he doing? He doesn't do anything until he kills the director. Then all of a sudden he's screaming, making one-liners. I'm like, okay, is this what we're doing? Then he does, like, something later. I don't... I just felt like he was, he wasn't established for it at all. Like, if you killed someone, like, in the first... if I don't know. Killed, like, a camp person earlier in the film or something to establish him more... I probably would have been better fine with it. Mm-hmm. Again, and I agree, he was not in the movie. Yeah, I think much. we're both agreeing on that. Like, I, I, so I think I probably would have liked him more. Although I found him, I don't know. Even what little he was there, I found him annoying. Mm-hmm. The whole high pitch stuff of like, oh, nailed it! <laughs> I don't. It's like, and that I dug. Like, <laughs> I it could. I don't know. It it just wasn't used well enough for me to dig it. Yeah, that's fine. It, it was just so. I just wasn't. Like, it, from when it when it was happening in the film, just felt like out of left field. Like, why is this happening? This doesn't seem like the kind of film. This is what they're going for. Mm-hmm. Um, and from and going off of that into like other stuff, I um, outside of Ali and Meatloaf, I don't. I feel like no one else. No one's get. No one else gets any character development really. Mm-hmm. Oh no, they definitely don't. They. I feel like everyone is shallow as fuck. And I also want to say, I feel like this movie could be called uh, Red Herring. The movie. It's like they're trying desperately to make like create like fifteen different people that could be the killer. Mm-hmm. But we're not letting you know who. It's like, is it the brother? Is it the groundskeeper? Is it this dude that likes uh, Camilla? Is it, is it Meatloaf? Is <laughs> it uh, this chick that's jealous? Is it, it's like I don't. Who are these people? I like I, this is one of those times where a horror film, and like most horror films, I like who d- develop the characters. So I know who these people are. This film does none of that. I was gonna say I definitely agree that they do that a lot, uh, and none of them tricked me. The entire movie, I was like, it's either the guy that likes her or it's uh, her brother. Because uh, mm-hmm. there was no other... All the other red herrings were such bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't... I, I didn't even care if it was tricking me or what. I was just like, man, why are they doing this? There's emphasis on this guy, emphasis on this guy. It's okay to put emphasis on maybe one or two people. Or maybe, like, one person, and then you find out it wasn't that person. It was too they're many. Like, they're flopping that shit everywhere. I Jesus do agree, Christ. yeah. Again, and, and that like, goes back to the it's a fan of a musical theater as opposed to a fan of horror movies making sure. a movie. Um, so, yeah, lack of character development. I didn't... Yeah, that's the thing that really got me. It's like, I just don't... Who, like, this guy... Oh, is this guy gay? I don't know, whatever. That's like... That's it. Then he dies. Then this chick dies. And this other lady who's been practicing singing, she dies. Who is that lady? I don't fucking know. Why is there... These people are dying. I don't know who they are. And that might be uh, a reason why I dug the movie more. Because uh, they were definitely... Uh, there was a definite lack of characterization because they almost had none. Because they all seemed to be straight up parodies slash caricatures of real actors in those sorts of productions and since i'm used to that i just kind of got the joke and went with it versus if that's not something you're used to you just see a bunch of shallow one-dimensional jokes with no like substance yeah i think i just would appreciate i almost want to say i almost would appreciate this film this is just a film not a musical like it's a uh, performing arts camp and they are trying to put on this production and this stuff is happening mm-hmm. and it wasn't trying to be comedy it wasn't it was trying to just be a horror film where this stuff happens i think i would have preferred this the story a lot more mm-hmm. in that context yeah and that's what... like i said i like meatloaf i liked ali mcdonald i like the general gist of what's going on but the rest of it oh boy it was not hitting the park mm-hmm. And it was sad because I, I I thought I'd enjoy this film because you suggested you recommended it from last year and like oh well this sounds like it's gonna be a good time and I'm watching it, I'm like oh no <laughs> mm, this is not a good time what's going on here come on I Steve liked this movie I got, there's gotta be something going on here and then I got done with it I was like well I I so I'm surprised I was not expecting to not like this film as much as I did and that's fine you know there's definitely a few movies that we just don't agree on yeah and this was just one of those cases I just could not not get into this movie at all. I thought the opening song was tedious, did not click with me. I liked the the song that, like, some of the stuff I like, used, uh, you know, McDonald was singing solo during her, like, part during the, 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 the musical. I didn't, the whole go to, I don't know, I don't know, the, I forget, I forgot I the song. The song Milo singing to her, like, get everyone pumped up to do the, the musical still. I didn't care for that. Like, the songs just didn't click with me either. And it's funny, because normally I can, I can get into most stuff. It's like, if, you know, comedy, music stuff, stuff like that. Things in this vein I can normally get into, but in this movie it was just a flat line for me. Mm-hmm. I was just not getting into it. <laughs> yeah, and that's totally at fun. all. So, uh, so my top three songs, if anyone cares about that, is and again I forget the titles <laughs> for these songs because I don't. I couldn't find them. They're not even really listed. Yeah, I, and I don't have the soundtracks yet, which is actually surprising because I like the music in this a lot. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I really liked the Killer's metal song that he sings to Meatloaf, uh, or the one that he sings before he kills. Whichever one's longer, <laughs> I get it mixed up. Yeah, that stuff will be. A- Actually, I want to say when the brothers revealed to be the killer, that whole all the sequences in like the kitchen. Like the horror movie part of the finale, <laughs> I thought it was actually really all really good. Yeah, that was actually done really well. Except except for like the kind of love interest boy just disappears for most of the movie, then shows back up at the end to plug in well, a, a song. That was red herring the movie. Yeah, <laughs> um, like I said, red herring the movie in effect. Uh, but yeah, I liked the killer song. Uh, my second favorite song was the opening song, as in the opening with the the camp, not like the ending of the haunting. I gotcha. I gotcha. The haunting. Uh, there's a lot of uh, musical jokes in that that I dug a lot. And the um, the song that Meatloaf sings, I loved a lot. Gotcha. So those are my top three, if anyone cares. So I guess let's just uh, jump into star ratings. Let's just Star ratings. Uh, I gotta say, this movie's a two for me. And that's fine. Um, no Ernest P. Whirl at a camp, so 4.5. 4.5. Uh, get that Ernest in there. He can sing a song. He'd be like... He can sing the song from Ernest Goes to Camp. Ernest. No, sing the song Ernest from Ernest Goes to Camp. Oh, sings Ernest Goes to Camp. Yeah, just put that song in this movie. <laughs> there you go. I don't, I don't remember Ernest Goes to Camp having a song. Yes, Ernest sings the song. That was the weirdest thing in the entire Ernest franchise that I actually forgot to mention on the podcast and realized it after we recorded the episode. Ernest has a, a solo song in Ernest Goes to Camp where he sings about how he's happy that it's raining because no one can see him. Oh, crap. that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally forgot yeah. about that. Just That's funny. one. It's funny, we totally forgot about that. Part. <laughs> totally didn't talk about that part. Um, so yeah, uh, I like stage fright a lot. So uh, I think what I've learned from this is that if you have experience with musical theater, or if with people that do musical theater, like not necessarily you've been in shows, but you hang out with people that do shows, I think that you'll like this film a lot because I think you'll see at least a couple of your friends or a few people that you know straight up in the movie. See, I, I knew those type of people in high school, and I didn't like those people. So I see them in this movie, I'm like, well, fuck you people. <laughs> <laughs> your people are ass- I, assholes in high school. I don't want to watch a movie about you. Jesus Christ, uh, fuck off. Okay, so here's your homework, guys. Uh, turn off this podcast uh, right now. Uh, then rate us on iTunes. Then buy Stage Fright and Fan of the Paradise and watch them both. And see if you uh, prefer Steve's opinion or Bill's opinion or we're both stupid and both movies suck or we're both right and both movies are awesome. It's the movie film's taste test. It's the taste test. I want everyone to comment on what they think of these films. That'd be fantastic. On our Facebook. Uh, or you can email us at moviefilmsofbillandsteve at gmail.com, and you can let us know what you think, like like Steve said. Or you can get on the Facebook, Movie Films of Bill and Steve. Just look up there. Uh, well, guess what, guys? I started putting our podcast up on YouTube. You can check it out. Uh, it's on my personal page for now because I've had an account for a long time, so I can add stuff longer. So uh, youtube.com slash Bill's Trademark. I think that's the name of the account. If not, just uh, go to the Facebook page, because I linked it there, and you can find it, subscribe, and everything. You can find it there, yeah. uh, You can also find us on our Tumblr, where all the episodes are posted, uh, moviefilmsofbillandsteve.tumblr.com, and as always, I'm on Twitter, at Bill. And of course, please check out my film, silverspotlightfilms.com, or www.facebook... Yeah, Jesus. www.facebook.com <laughs> slash silverspotlightfilms. The Facebook page is fun, because that's where I post like the links to shorts and stuff. Like I don't post like the illegal quote-unquote fan films that I do to, like, the Silver Spotlight page, because that's mainly for the movie purchasing. So, you know, get the Facebook page a like. That way you can get updates on when I'm making shorts. There's uh, probably one or two more coming soon. I, uh, I'm i going to be doing a Power Rangers RPM fan film. Hell yeah. It's just going to be, like, a little two-minute thing, but I want to do a little something. And that way you can keep an eye out for the Survivors, because I'm setting up uh, the next shooting date very soon, and then after that I think it's going to just be uh snowballing quicker and quicker because uh pretty much just a case of getting the two hardest shooting days done first and then i only have to worry about a lot of the smaller easier stuff and then it's just editing so i'm i'm guessing survivors will be uh late winter 2016 release date come christmas day it'll be underneath your christmas tree motherfucker that's not what i said but okay i'm saying it so when when it happens when it doesn't happen they can blame you perfect and I'll probably do a little Indiegogo for, like, just a couple hundred bucks just for, like, costumes and stuff. And that'll just be a pre-order for the DVD, the Blu-ray, or I've already decided the Steve Rzinski Hack Collection, uh, which will be a Blu-ray with all of my films on it for $50. That'd be pretty cool. Does that have, like, does that have like your old, old That That I will include Wolfster Part 1 and 2, and I'm thinking about including Basic Slaughter. I may as well. Fuck it. It's a terrible film, but fuck it. No, I should include everything. I don't have my old, old stuff anymore. Like, it doesn't exist. 
You, you can find it. <laughs> I can't! Like, I don't even know where the hard drive for that is anymore. <laughs> well, you should go where the Ark of the Covenant is. That's the joke someone would make in this oh, position. Oh, fuck, I'm sorry. Check out the Indiegogo when it drops. You'll hear about it here first, baby. Woo! Woo! Hey, if you want to be the man, you get it. Give me money. <laughs> Give me money. <laughs> uh, style and profile. And how do you think I feel standing here when I made more money in one year than you did all of last year? I spent... I fucked up this entire quote. <laughs> <laughs> I can start again. Hold on, guys. Where I made more money in one year than you, I spent more money on still liquor... Fast cars from one side of this nation to the other. You're talking to the Rolex wearing, woo, diamond ring wearing, kiss stealing, jet flying, wheeling dealing. I, I fucked it all up. That's great. I don't care. <laughs> Leave it. I love Ric Flair quotes. <laughs> I love Ric Flair. Uh, and as always, guys, I've been Bill. And I've been Steve. Can't you feel the vibes in your own house, man? Bad sport. Real bad. The karma's so thick around here, you need an aqua lung to breathe. <laughs>